Let's start then. So I'm happy to introduce Nathan, our first speaker of the Graduate Student Seminar this spring, uh, who's going to talk about application of lattices to squares. Okay, well, first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers, Karina and Willie, for the invitation. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about Lagrange's four squares theorem. Um, and uh, maybe just also a shout out to Matt Dannenberg for showing me this uh, wonderful piece of math. Okay, so as the name suggests, uh, Lagrange's four squares theorem says, uh, okay, so theorem. Uh, every positive integer is a sum of four squares. So for any, any natural number n, you can write it as a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. Uh, where a, b, c, and d are all greater than or equal to zero, let's say. Okay, so let's, let's talk a bit about the history behind this problem. Um, okay, so first, it seems like Diophantus was aware of this, uh, a statement like this, so it goes back to roughly uh, 200 AD. Um, and uh, so Diophantus did a lot of examples in uh, his book, Arithmetica. And then later on, uh, Bachet, the French mathematician, translated Arithmetica from Greek to Latin. So this is sometimes called Bachet's conjecture. Um, okay. And then uh, Fermat looked at Bachet's translation uh, and he thought that something like this should be, should be a theorem. Um, and so he, he actually claimed it. Uh, yeah, I mean, he claimed also another pretty famous theorem. Uh, so uh, what Fermat showed is that, so Fermat didn't quite prove uh, the four squares theorem, uh, but Fermat showed something related. So he showed that every, uh, sorry, not every, an odd prime uh, let's say P uh, is a sum of two squares if and only if P is congruent to one mod uh, mod four. Uh, and so now this is called Fermat's two squares theorem. And then finally, Lagrange was the first to give a, a full proof. Uh, so this is uh, in 1770. And his proof involved playing around with, with numbers, um, the properties of primes, a lot of congruence relations. So today I'd like to give a more, a more geometric argument. So one ingredient that Lagrange used uh, and will also use uh, is this identity due to uh, Euler. So um, it's a bit of a pain to write out. So let me just copy it.
Okay, wonderful. Oops. Okay, so uh, this is a lemma due to Euler. Uh, and it says that if you have any, if you have any numbers a, b, c, d, p, q, r, s, so these are all, let's say, non-negative integers, then you have this identity. Uh, so what it's saying is that if you have if you have two numbers, each of which can be written as a sum of four squares, then their product can also be written as a sum of four squares. Right, so what does this mean for us? Well, for us, this means that it suffices to prove Lagrange's four squares theorem for prime numbers. Okay, so that's the upshot. So it suffices to prove the theorem for prime numbers. Okay, so uh, any questions before I begin? Okay, so let's let's do a review of uh, lattices and uh, we'll use it to prove Minkowski's theorem. Is the proof of the lemma just computation or is there a trick or some algebraic? No, nope, it's just multiplication. Okay, nice. Yep. Um, Sorry. Uh, I, sorry, I won't show that this is... Uh, the identity is motivated by complex numbers. Uh, sorry, quaternions. The, the lemma? Yeah, uh, I mean, Bob once said something like that, but anyway. Wait, sorry, do you mean this lemma or do you mean uh, Lagrange's theorem? Uh, that lemma. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's just, it's literally multiplication. I don't know. Uh, there could be um, something about quaternions, maybe hidden in the background. Yeah, it's funny. Sorry, it doesn't matter. It's, yeah, I mean, maybe it's something about norms. Okay, let's see. So let's let's look at lattices and Minkowski's theorem. Okay, so uh, let's start with a vector space. Uh, let's say of dimension n over, over the real numbers. Okay, so a lattice um, is just a, it's a subgroup which is generated over z by uh, some collection of independent vectors. So a lattice, uh, lambda is um, subgroup, which is of the form uh, lambda is equal to the Z, uh, all Z linear combinations of some vectors. So E1 up to ER. Uh, so here with all EI linearly independent. So these EI are elements of elements of the vector space. Okay, uh, and a lattice is called full. So here, lambda is full if r is equal to n. So over the real numbers, these uh, these uh, vector span. Okay, so now let's fix v 
and uh, lambda as above, um, full lattice. Okay, so using uh, using lambda, uh, and let's say we we are also given uh, some some element of our lattice, so lambda naught. So we can define fundamental parallelopipeds. So these are of the form uh, so d equals uh, let's see. So we take we take lambda not, and then we add on uh, multiples of our lattice uh, our generators, where these these coefficients here, so the AI are going to be in zero to one. Okay. Uh, oh. Maybe just to be safe, I'll put open brackets on this side. Right. So, uh, the pic what's the picture? So, let me uh, let me just borrow this picture. Okay. Somehow it killed the color. Okay. Well, anyways. Uh, okay. There you go. Okay. So uh, here's the, here's the picture. So uh, in this example, our vector space. Sorry. In this example, our vector space is R two. Uh, it's generated by these two solid red arrows. Uh, so in this case, I think it's like three, three zero and uh, two one. And this uh, parallelogram shaded in blue is an example of a, um, a fundamental parallelopiped. So I'll refer to these as uh, FPs, uh, just because it's Bit of a pain to write out. Okay, so these are fundamental parallel pipettes. Okay. Uh, okay, theorem. So let D not be a fundamental parallelopiped. Uh, and let's say we're, we're in the situation above. So we have V and we have lambda, which is a full lattice. So let uh, S be a measurable set. Oops. So S is a measurable set uh, in V. So if the measure of S is greater than the measure of our fundamental parallel pipette, then S contains distinct uh, points, alpha and beta, such that uh, alpha, or, or let's say, um, yeah, alpha minus beta is in our lattice. Okay, so the, the picture here is, um, I don't know. It's like you can imagine you have a floor which is tiled in, tiled in parallelograms or something, and you know you you accidentally spill too much water. Um, you know more water than 
and be contained in one, one such parallelogram. And so then something needs to overlap. All right, so um, maybe here's, here's an example of a set S. And in this example, so for instance, you can choose this point and this point. And their difference is going to be an element of our lattice. Okay, there you go. It's a comms problem. Okay, great. So, um, okay. So I won't, I mean, the proof is you take your set S, you intersect it with these parallelograms, um, you know, these fundamental parallel pipettes, and then you shift all of them so that they're contained in one fundamental parallel pipette. And the claim is that uh, there's some overlap because, because of our condition that the measure of S is greater than the measure of D naught. Okay, so now let's, so let's consider uh, a set, uh, so T inside of V with the property with the following property. So if I have alpha and beta in T, uh, then this implies that one half alpha minus beta is also in T. And so I'll, I'll label this property with a star. Okay, let's just assume that T is a set that satisfies this property. And let's let's let S be one half T. Um, so meaning point wise, I, I take every point in T, multiply it by every vector in T, uh, multiply it by one half and um, call that my set S. So then, then T contains Well, it contains the difference of any two points, you know, any two points of S by this property star. Okay, so let's now apply this theorem above. Uh, oh, whoops. Let's apply this theorem above to our set S. So, so apply theorem to S. Okay, so then the statement we, we see is that, so as above, we have our, our vector space V, we have, um, we have our uh, fundamental, our full uh, lattice lambda and our fundamental parallelopipeds. So if uh, the measure of, of S is greater than the measure of D, then uh, there exists S1, S2, and S such that uh, S1 minus S2 is in our lattice lambda. Okay, but now let's just make two observations. Uh, so the first is that well, we can rewrite things. So what is the measure of S? Well, S is defined as one half T. Uh, and so if we're in n dimensional space, this is like you're scaling everything. Uh, you're scaling your set in every direction by a factor of, by, uh, you're scaling it down you know, by a factor of one half. So the measure of this is, Q to the minus n times 
the measure of t. Okay. The second observation is that uh, since S1 and S2 are in S, so we can write, well, let's write S1 equal to alpha, one half alpha. And, uh, and S2 is one half beta for some alpha and beta in T. And then we get that, so this means that S1 minus S2, well, this is one half uh, alpha minus beta. Uh, but one half alpha minus beta is in T. Right. It's in T by this property star, uh, what we assumed about our set T to begin with. So this is in T intersected with, uh, let's say, lambda minus zero, minus the origin. OK. So what is the uh, what is the conclusion? So the conclusion is, so we can rewrite. Let let me sort of bracket this. So let's rewrite. Uh, what's bracketed above as as the following. So. If T is a set satisfying uh, that property star, that alpha in beta in T implies that one half alpha minus beta is in T, that uh, satisfying star, and so we're going to rewrite the measure theoretic condition as uh, mu of T is greater than two to the n times mu of d, then t contains a point in lambda minus order. Okay. Okay, so now, now we can state Minkowski's theorem. Um, maybe just some, uh, or, or just recall. So recall, uh, T is convex if P and Q in T implies that the line spanned by these two points is also uh, is contained in T, and it's uh, symmetric in the origin. If uh, for any P in, in T, uh, negative P, Minus p is also in t. Okay, so here's Minkowski's theorem. Okay, so let's see. This is uh, eighteen ninety six. So let, let T uh, be a subset of V, which is 
uh, first of all, it's compact. Uh, it's also convex and symmetric in the origin. Okay, so it, if it satisfies these properties uh, and the measure of t is greater than or equal to q to the n times mu of d, then t contains a point of lambda uh, outside of the origin. So let's say lambda minus the origin. OK, so notice here that we rewrote these brackets as, uh, OK, let me switch to a different color. So we have these brackets now. But the assumption here is that mu of t is strictly greater than 2 to the n times mu of d. Um, on the other hand, so in, in this theorem of Minkowski, we've replaced it with an inequality greater than or equal to, um, but we've also added this condition that, that the set is compact. Right? So the proof here um, is basically uh, just one line. Uh, so first of all, t satisfies star. And, uh, okay, so that's the first observation is that it satisfies that property. So we can apply, we can apply this, uh, this statement in, in the blue brackets. And now we just want to replace, uh, let's replace T with one plus epsilon times T. Right, so if you if you replace t with one plus epsilon, now you do have a strict inequality, um, uh, and so we want to replace do this replacement, and uh, so this is for any epsilon, and show that some uh, lattice point. is in the interior of one plus epsilon times t. Right. Um, and then in the limit, this lattice point will be, uh, it'll be contained in t because it's compact. Okay. So now that we have this theorem of Minkowski, we can go back and prove Lagrange's four squares theorem. Okay, so proof of uh, Lagrange, Lagrange's theorem. Okay, so the first observation is that uh, two is one plus one. Okay, great. So now it suffices, suffices to prove the theorem for odd prime. Okay, so we want to show that for any odd prime, um, let's say p, uh, we can write it as a sum of squares where the squares are allowed to be zero, uh, or where each integer is allowed to be zero. Okay, so this is going to uh, proceed in a, in a few steps. Step one is the observation that the congruence, uh, so the congruence let's say 
m squared plus n squared plus one congruent to zero mod p. This has a solution in z. As a solution uh, in z. I mean, technically, m and n here, they really only matter uh, in z mod pz. Um, but that's the claim. So let's let's rewrite this condition. So if we rewrite it, we get m squared is congruent to minus n squared minus one mod p. And okay, so now here's the observation. Uh, if you have m and you have n, and let's say they vary from zero up to p minus one, then the claim is that uh, the claim is that these these quantities m squared and minus n minus one uh, minus n squared minus one they take they each take on on uh, p plus one divided by two uh, distinct values. in C mod PZ. Okay. So let's let's assume this. Um, this statement is, is fairly straightforward, um, but let me assume it for now. So if these each take on distinct values, then so if uh, okay, how should I say it? So if m squared is never congruent to minus n squared minus one mod p, then in total this would give, well you have p plus one over two distinct values coming from each of them. So in total that's p plus one distinct values in z mod pz, which is a contradiction. So then we get total of p plus one distinct elements in c mod pc, which is a contradiction. Okay, so that proves that this congruence has a solution. Any questions? Okay, step two, let's fix, so let's fix M and N as above. Uh, solutions to that congruence. And let's consider the, so inside of Z4, we can consider a lattice lambda, which is defined by the following relations. So these are going to be tuples of, uh, uh, you, you know, quadruples of uh, points A, B, C, D, subject to the relation that C is congruent to, uh, let's see, M A plus N B, and D is congruent to M B minus N A uh, mod P. Okay, so the first observation about this lattice lambda is that, uh, so, well, it sits inside of C4 by, by definition, uh, but it contains the sublattice p times z4. And well, this is pretty straightforward. If a, b, c, and d are all multiples of p, 
then these congruence relations become vacuous. It's just saying that zero is congruent to zero. Okay, so furthermore, uh, so lambda mod p times z4, uh, it's a two dimensional, it's a two dimensional subspace of uh, subspace of FP or and the reason for this is that if you vary A and B, that determines C and D uniquely up up to multiples of B. So is that? Uh, okay, well, lambda mod P times Z4 being two-dimensional means that uh, lambda inside of Z4, so this is two-dimensional. This means that lambda inside of Z4 has index B squared. Um, you can think of each of these as having index p squared if you want. Okay, so this means that lambda has a fundamental parallel of piped. So lambda has a fundamental parallel of piped d, let's say, of uh, volume p squared. Okay, now step three. We want to apply Minkowski's theorem. So let's choose a, a set T, which is um, compact, convex, uh, and symmetric about the origin. So in fact, T here is going to be a closed ball. Uh, so about as nice as you can get, a closed ball of radius R, centered at the origin. Okay, so then the volume of, of T, uh, so T is a closed ball in, in four space. Uh, the volume is pi squared times R to the four over two. Okay, so the final thing is we want to choose Choose R so that 2P is greater than R, but also uh, R squared, but also R squared is greater than 1.9P. So these numbers are not chosen arbitrarily. They're, I mean, this is, uh, this is very much rigged in our favor. Okay. So what is this, let's just, uh, let's use this property. So what does this say about the measure of T? Well, so the measure of T, this is pi squared times R to the four over two. Uh, this is greater than pi squared times 1.9 P squared divided by two. Um, and if you multiply everything out, this is approximately 18.8146 and so on, times uh, p squared, uh, which is greater than 16 times p squared. Uh, and 16 times p squared happens to be two to the four times the measure of d. Okay. So we're in this scenario where the measure of T is greater than some power of two. So in this case, two to the dimension times the measure of B. So now we can apply Minkowski's theorem. So 
the Minkowski theorem implies that there exists uh, some lattice vector A, B, C, and D in uh, our lattice lambda, uh, let's say minus the origin, intersected with our ball of radius r. Okay, so what do each of these conditions mean? So, so let's, uh, so one, the fact that A, B, C, and D are in lambda minus the origin means that, well, if we write out the congruence relation, so A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared, this is going to be congruent to, so remember, where is lambda here? Uh, lambda was defined here. So let's replace, uh, let's replace C and D using those congruence relations. So if we replace C and D using those congruence relations, we see that this is congruent to A squared times one plus M squared plus N squared plus B squared times one plus M squared plus N squared. And this is all mod P. Um, just working out the calculations. But M and N are precisely chosen. Their solutions to one plus M squared plus N squared is congruent to zero mod P. So all of this is congruent to zero mod P. Okay. Uh, what else do we know? Well, A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared um, is non-zero. In fact, it's positive because uh, a, B, C, and D uh, are not, do not represent the origin. So A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus D squared is also strictly greater than zero. Okay. And now the, the second observation is that A, B, C, and D inside of T, what does this mean? Well, um, so a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared. This is the distance from, this is the distance from uh, the origin to the vector a, b, c, d. Uh, technically the distance squared. Um, right, but it's in T, and T is a ball of radius R. So this is less than or equal to R squared. But R squared, by this blue box um, assumption, R squared is less than 2P. Okay, so now A squared plus B squared plus C squared plus, plus D squared, this is a number, it's a multiple of p because it's congruent to zero. It's also less than 2p and it's positive. So that means it's equal to p. Okay, so a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared is equal to p. Okay, so um, this result was stated by Fermat. Uh, I think Euler tried to prove it over the course of 40 years and then Lagrange succeeded. Uh, any questions? Uh, one question. Mm -hmm. um, you specifically isolated the case P equals two in the beginning. I guess that's related to the like, P plus one over two kind of logic. Yeah, okay. yeah. I think there's a little bit of a. I mean, there it's it's also a. You sort of get one unique 
solution to m m squared uh, to this congruence relation m squared plus n squared plus mm -hmm. congruent to zero. Okay. Um, I think you can choose. In that case, you can choose. Uh, well, you're working mod two, so you can choose m to be one and m to be zero. For instance. Okay. So you would just have to make a choice there instead of using the general logic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's uh, let me see how much time I have. Uh, okay, so for 10 minutes. So let me just talk a bit about some generalizations. Okay, so uh, what else is known about problems of this form. Well, Ramanujan uh, somehow his name shows up everywhere. Um, so Ramanujan proved that uh, there are exactly fifty four quadratic forms uh, uh, so these are things of the form x times a squared plus y times b squared plus uh, plus c times c squared plus w times b squared so there are exactly 54 of these quadratic forms that represent all positive integers. Okay, so Lagrange's four squares theorem is really a special case of, of this, uh, in the case that x, y, z, and w are all equal to one. Um, okay, what else is known? So Jacobi, uh, he, sh he gave a, so he gave a formula uh, for the function R of n. So R of n here is, uh, so it's defined to be the number of ways that a given uh, natural number can be represented as a sum of four squares. And so the, the theorem, uh, Jacobi, is that R of n uh, is equal to the divisor function, um, but with a with a slight twist. So you take the divisor function, but you also want to exclude all divisors of n. Uh, sorry, all uh, all divisors that are multiple of four. So, uh, for instance. R of 1 is equal to 8 in this case. Um, so 1 can be written as a sum of four squares eight different ways. Um, so when I say different ways of representing a number as a sum of four squares, I mean as a vector. Um, so as an ordered tuple. So um, this is really counting, you know, uh, one can be written as plus or minus one squared. Um, or you can you can sort of shift it around. Okay, and uh, there's two proofs here. Um, so um, actually, one of them involves quaternions, as 
I think Owen mentioned earlier. Um, and the other involves properties of modular forms. So these, these divisor functions, uh, quite frequently they show up as maybe um, coefficients of, of some modular forms. Okay. Yeah, so let's look at, yeah, question? Is Jacobi's theorem sort of, could you prove that independently of the four squares theorem and use that as a proof of the four squares theorem? By saying like this right-hand side is always at least- Yes, <laughs> technically, yes. yes. Um, I mean, I think it seems much harder, but absolutely. Okay, so now let's look uh, at triangles rather than squares. So definition. Uh, the last definition, uh, a triangular number. Oh, actually, in fact, I think I saved a, a note somewhere. Because this is also a bit of a thing to write out. Okay, so, oops. So this is a definition, the definition of a triangular number. It's uh, a number of the form a times a plus one over two. Uh, and so, for instance, if a is one, this is just a one. If you plug in a equals two, you get three. If you plug in a equals three, you get six. And if you plug in four, you get 12 and so on. So um, these, are, these are numbers of this form. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's state uh, the result. So this is a theorem due to Gauss. Uh, and it's called Gauss's Eureka Theorem. Uh, so the statement is that every positive integer uh, can be written as the sum of three or fewer triangular numbers. Uh, and in fact, this can be generalized further. Uh, to, this can be generalized uh, to something called Fermat's uh, polygonal number theorem. So Gauss's theorem is about triangular numbers, but you can define, uh, well, you have squares, you can define uh, pentagonal numbers uh, and so on, n-gonal numbers uh, by just arranging the, these sort of, uh, I guess, arranging points in some sort of configuration, like a, a regular n-gon, and then sort of adding more and more points. Um, okay. Um, okay, so maybe the, the last thing I'll mention. So there's also, uh, for the algebraic geometers in the audience, this also has applications to algebraic geometry. So um, one place where it shows up is something called Zarhin's trick. Okay, so Zarhin's trick is about abelian varieties. Uh, so here, um, let A be an abelian variety of dimension G. Oops. Uh, so this is dimension G 
so in this case, an abelian variety is, think of it like a complex torus. It's, it's a special sort of complex torus, uh, complex dimension G. So you can take A to the power of four and take its product with the dual torus uh, to the power of four. So this carries a principal polarization. So uh, I mean, what is so this this thing is also an abelian variety. It's it's also a complex torus, but now it has dimension eight g. Um, and these principal polarizations are are very special. Um, and so I thought it was well, it's sort of a miracle that um, Zarhin's trick even exists. Um, and I think the only proof uh, sort of follows through Lagrange's four squares theorem. So anyways, I'll, I'll end here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nathan. Um, are there any questions? Can you, can you say more about science trick, like how that works? Oh, this, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, so it, at the end of the day, it sort of boils down to some linear algebra. Producing a principal polarization is like a, you have, you have a lattice and when you, so you have a lattice lambda and you, you sort of, I guess, from the complex geometry point of view, mm -hmm. um, after you do a change of basis, you can you can do a symplectic change of basis, and then you get, I guess, um, let's see, you have like the identity on one side, and you have, sorry, not the identity, you have, yeah, you have the identity on one side, and then you have a symplectic matrix um, on the on the other side, and this is just some, this is just some sort of linear algebra about how this symplectic basis actually can be rewritten as a principal polarization. Okay. I mean, it's sort of, I think it's, um, yeah, honestly, I, I, it's like magic. It's uh, just sort of do it and it works. I see. Nathan? Yes. Is that a, like, if you reduce it to just three squares, like a three square square uh, theorem, is that such a thing or no? So there is a three squares theorem, but it, it doesn't say that every number can be written as a sum of three squares. It says that every number not of the form um, seven times something, um, every number that's not of this particular form can be written as a sum of three squares. So most, I guess the first case that shows up is seven, the number seven. If you think about seven, the only way you can write it as a sum of squares is of the form two squared plus one plus one plus one, right? So seven sort of requires, uh, it requires um, four squares. Fair enough. All right, um, any other questions? If not, then yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Nathan. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you guys.